Even though they've been out for several years, SGLT2 medications like Jardians, Invokana, Farziga, and Stiglato are the newest class of diabetes medications. In the past few years, they've become one of the fastest growing types of diabetes medications that we use because of their effectiveness, the safety profile, and the extra benefits that they offer beyond just lowering blood glucose. But if you're watching this video, it's because you want to know why. You want to know everything about these medications, including how they work, how well they work, what the side effects are, and what those extra benefits are that make them so cool. So let's talk all about SGLT2 inhibitors on this edition of Sugar High. Welcome to Sugar High guys, and a special welcome to you if you're new here. I'm PA David, I'm a board certified and licensed diabetes specialty PA in Southern California, and Sugar High is a channel that brings you relatable information on diabetes, medication, diet info, how to use certain medications, and anything else you wanna know about related to diabetes. Now since today's video is all about medications in the SGLT2 inhibitor family like Invokana, Farziga, Jardians, and Stiglatro, we need to talk a little bit about how the kidneys normally work before we can really get into what these medications do. So let me show you. All right, first of all, your kidneys are awesome. All day long, they filter the trash out of your bloodstream into this squiggly little tube called the nephron. And all the waste products that your body wants to get rid of collect in here. But before we throw it all away into the urine, the nephron kind of sifts through the junk a little bit just to make sure that there's nothing that we accidentally threw away that we wanted to keep, like this glucose. This is not something that we want to throw away. This isn't waste, we need this. So I'm gonna pull that back out of here and I'm gonna put it back in my bloodstream. And if I find more things that I want to keep, ooh, there's another one. I'm gonna put that in my bloodstream too. And it pulls all the things back that you want to keep and whatever's left over that's actually junk, that all gets thrown away. Now, while you and I would be like pulling every single dollar out of this trash pile because we don't want to throw this away in real life, your kidneys aren't greedy like that. Your kidneys kind of know that there's a maximum amount of glucose in your blood that you really need in order to be healthy. And if that glucose level gets above a certain point, your kidneys recognize that and they say, you know what? the glucose level is already too high as it is. So if I pull all this sugar out of the urine, then it's gonna make it even higher. So you know what? Let's just let it go because we don't need to keep all this. So let's pretend that this water is your blood sugar level. Without diabetes, your insulin would normally keep your blood sugar at a maximum of 140. It should never get as high as 170. But if it did, if your sugar managed to get itself up to 170, your kidneys would let that extra sugar go and it would start spilling out into your urine like it is right here. So at this point, you're probably wondering how these medications fit in. Well, in type two diabetes, the kidneys get greedy and instead of letting the sugar go at 170 like they should, they hold on to it for even longer and the sugar level is able to go up because the kidneys are pulling it back into the bloodstream even though the sugar level is too high. They don't let the sugar go into the urine until your sugar hits like 250. Well, medications in the SGLT2 family let that sugar go and they keep the kidneys from holding on to that sugar to bring it back down to where it should be. And they can even reduce that threshold to take it down to where anything above 120 will result in glucose going into the urine. One of the cool things about this though is that it still sets a minimum to where anything below 120 won't result in extra sugar going out, so it won't keep pushing sugar out through the urine and result in you going hypoglycemic. So that's how SGLT2 medications work. Let's talk about some of the members of the family. In the United States, there are four SGLT2 medications available. They're called Invokana, Farziga, Jardians, and Stiglatro. In Europe, Farziga is known as Forsiga, but it's the same medication. There's also another medication in Europe called Zinquista that's not available in the US. Interesting thing about Zinquista is that in Europe, it's approved for treating type two and type one diabetes, which might make you wonder, wait a minute, I thought pills didn't work for type one diabetics. I thought they could only use insulin and pills were just for type two diabetes. 
Well, that's one of the really cool things about these medications. The effect of your kidneys on blood glucose has nothing to do with insulin. Most of the type 2 diabetes medications that we have work by either trying to get your pancreas to make more insulin or to get your body to respond better to insulin. Since people with type 1 diabetes don't make enough insulin at all, and they don't have a resistance to insulin, most oral diabetes medications aren't really applicable to somebody with type 1. But since this effect has nothing to do with insulin, SGLT2 inhibitors cause the kidneys to release that extra glucose whether you have type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, or even if you don't have diabetes at all. So why aren't these medications approved for type 1 in the United States? Well, they tried. A couple of years ago, there was an FDA submission to try to get approval for one of these meds for type 1 diabetes. And after reviewing all of the available information, there was a split decision in the FDA of 8 against 8 being for and against. When there's a tie at the FDA, it's a no. The big concern amongst those who voted no had to do with the risk of diabetic ketoacidosis. So on that topic, we should probably have a conversation about risks and side effects. You know, that part of the commercial where they read off all those terrible side effects and basically convince you that this medication is going to 100% kill you if you take it. Well, let's talk about what those are and see if we can put them into context, okay? Remember that it's important to keep in mind that side effects are just possibilities, they're not promises. And the majority of people who take these medications do just fine and don't experience the things that we're about to go through. I like to divide side effects into serious side effects and common side effects so that we keep it all in context while still being fair and complete in our discussion. This isn't really a side effect, but one consideration about using these medications is that in order for them to do any good, you have to have good kidney function to start with. When using these medications to treat type 2 diabetes, people who have really severe chronic kidney disease can't use them. But it's not because the medication is going to make the kidneys worse. It's just that these medications use the kidneys to get rid of glucose through the urine. And if your kidneys are already failing, then they don't work well enough for you to get any good from the medication in the first place. And if a medication doesn't do us any good, then we don't use it. Now, in terms of actual side effects, let's start with the common ones. Of all the side effects that are particularly common, one complaint that we hear pretty frequently is that people feel like they just need to pee more often. Again, the action of these medications is in the kidneys themselves. So you might notice that you need to go to the bathroom an extra one or two or three times per day. And this is mostly just a nuisance, but people who drive for a living or people who already have some pre-existing difficulties with bladder control might find this a little bit problematic. In fact, just talking about it kind of makes me have to, excuse me, just a second. All right, I'm good. Another pretty common side effect is yeast infections. Urine doesn't normally have sugar in it, but if we give extra sugar to the normal bacteria and the yeast in the genital area, it might be able to overgrow. The problem is obviously more common in women because of the differences in anatomy, but it can happen in men too, particularly in uncircumcised men. Speaking of bacteria and putting sugar in the urine, Urinary tract infections are commonly reported in people taking these medications too. Although this one's kind of debatable because in a lot of the clinical trials, the occurrences of bladder infection in people taking the medication was the same as in people who were taking placebo, which kind of makes you wonder if the bladder infections are really happening directly because of the medication, or if it's just that people with diabetes in general are more susceptible to having bladder infections. For both yeast infections and bladder infections, one easy way to reduce the chances of these happening is to increase your water intake. The more water you drink, the more you can dilute the glucose in the urine and flush the pipes, so to speak. And that seems to really minimize both of these side effects. But even apart from that, the increased bladder infections and yeast infections seem to happen most commonly within the first couple months after starting the medication. So if you hang in there and treat the infections if they come up, it's pretty common that they don't continue to happen as often once you've had a chance to get acclimated to the medication. Excuse me. All right, sorry. There's also the possibility that the medications in this class can raise your cholesterol a small amount. Thankfully, it's a pretty minor amount, usually like four to 5% increase in the LDL. So for example, your LDL started at 90, it might go up to like 95, but it's not gonna say double your cholesterol. All right, let's go ahead and cover the serious side effects. Now, these are not common, but in the extraordinarily unlikely event that they do happen, they do carry a greater effect on safety. We already said that these medications can make you pee a bit more often. It's not like it pulls a ridiculous amount of water out of you, but if you don't drink enough water to replace the fluid that you lose in urine, that can lead to dehydration. 
Severe dehydration can cause acute kidney failure and can result in low blood pressure, which can cause dizziness or fainting. One of these medications even lists wrist fractures as a side effect, which probably results from people's blood pressure dropping, they get dizzy and fall, and then extend their arms to try to catch themselves, which can break the wrist as it hits. But hopefully you can see how all of these lead back to dehydration, which is why I always advise my patients to drink more water when I prescribe them these meds, because that's a really simple way to reduce the odds of those things happening. Excuse me. Sorry. Remember how we said that genital yeast infections and urinary tract infections can happen more frequently? Well, if infections don't get treated, or in really rare cases, the skin and tissue that's around that area can become so damaged that it can't heal. This condition is called Fournier's gangrene, and it sounds terrifying. But out of the thousands and thousands of people in the US who take these medications, less than 10 people each year have had this complication between 2013 and 2019. Diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA for short, is another one that's super rare, but something that we keep our eye out for. There have been a handful of cases where people using these medications went into DKA, which is the major emergency of diabetes. It's incredibly rare, but in most cases, it didn't just happen out of nowhere. It most commonly resulted from people either stopping their insulin when they started these medications, or as a result of infection, or severe dehydration, or excessive alcohol intake. Lastly, there's one medication in the family called Invokana that's gotten a lot of attention in regard to a concern over amputation. Now, since this video is, a, is about the class of meds overall, and the warning is specific to Invokana and not the others, I'll go deeper into amputation in a dedicated video on Invokana itself. But suffice to say that this issue was only seen in one study, there was no increased amputation seen in a bunch of other studies, and that the average person taking Invokana really shouldn't worry much that they're gonna lose a foot just from taking that medication. I'll be right back. So there's your list of possible side effects, both common and uncommon, associated with these medications. But let's talk a little bit about why you might actually be willing to try it. These are actually the most strongly recommended oral diabetes medications after metformin. For all the annoyances that they can cause, there's a lot of good that can actually come out of these medications. For one thing, they work really well. These suckers drop A1C by like 1% by themselves and around 2% if they're used in combination with metformin. And some people get even greater drop in A1C depending on how high the A1C was when they started out. The higher you start, the greater the drop we normally see. These medications are about as effective as sulfonylureas like glipizide, glibiride, and glimepiride. And in some studies, certain meds in this family actually performed better than glimepiride, but without the weight gain and without the hypoglycemia that sulfonylureas so commonly cause. Also, since we're now directly urinating out glucose, these meds tend to help a little bit with weight reduction. The amount of glucose that you pee out can be up to 400 calories worth, which is like the amount of calories that I burn when I go running for two miles. Now that's not a substitute for exercise and they're not meant to be thought of as weight loss pills. The amount of weight reduction is only like four or five pounds on average, but a diabetes medication that causes weight loss rather than weight gain is nice. A lot of the older diabetes pills help reduce the blood sugar, but they increased the weight. Here's something else that's super cool about these meds. Most of these medications can help reduce the possibility of cardiovascular death and hospitalization from heart failure. All new diabetes meds in the US are required to have a clinical trial performed on them in order to prove that they don't increase your chance of cardiovascular disease. Well, not only were these medications shown to be safe in terms of heart risk, but some of them have actually been shown to reduce the chance of cardiovascular death, and all of them seem to reduce the chance of heart failure. This is awesome, because people with diabetes don't die of high blood glucose, they die of heart disease. And if we can use a diabetes medication that helps reduce the risk above and beyond just improving your blood glucose, that's a great thing. Another huge benefit of these meds is what they can do to protect the kidneys. One of the biggest concerns of diabetes complications is chronic kidney disease. People with diabetes probably go on dialysis more than any other individual group. And when these medications first came out, a lot of us had the suspicion that they might be bad for the kidneys. I know I certainly worried about that. Well, it turns out that in several different clinical trials, they tracked the kidney function and they found that most of these medications tend to keep kidney function from getting weaker. In type two diabetes, Kidney strength tends to weaken as the years go by, 
but in at least two of these medications, Invokana and Farsiga, kidney function stayed steady over the course of several different clinical trials. So the combination of the fact that these medications are effective, they're generally safe, they don't cause hypoglycemia, they protect the heart and they protect the kidneys is why many diabetes treatment guidelines, including the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, recommend SGLT2 inhibitors like Invokana, Farsiga, and Jardians as the preferred oral treatment if metformin alone is not enough and a second medication is needed. And that's your overview of the medications in the SGLT2 inhibitor class. As we mentioned earlier, there are some differences among the medications in this class in terms of cardiovascular and kidney benefits they offer, as well as some specific side effect warnings uh, in some and not others. So if you're curious about a specific medication in this family, keep an eye out for other videos on this channel discussing each one individually. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you did, hit that thumbs up button. It really does help the channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure you hit that button too, because you're not going to want to miss out on all the sugar high that's coming your way. I'll see you in the next video.